Good afternoon. This special meeting of the Baltimore City Council Committee of the Whole is now called to order. I'm asking that those who have cell phones please turn them off or put them on vibrate. Before we proceed, it is important that we first respect one of the Council's oldest customs by opening our proceeding with a prayer. Today, we are honored to have Rabbi Shulman, the President of the Baltimore Jewish Council, to lead us in our invocation. Blessed are you, eternal God, for renewing us to life this day, for this day is both precious and important. Grateful to live in a city rich in history and diverse in culture, we pray for well-being and a sense of community. May the spirit of champions on the football field that unites us in civic pride also be the spirit we champion in coming together to meet the fiscal, social, educational, and safety challenges before us. May our city's elected officials lead us as we need them to, working to alleviate the circumstances of vulnerability and insecurity so many of us feel. Our God and God of humanity, this is why you renew us to life this day. Today is another opportunity to discover that our aspirations and convictions, our diversity and character, our initiative and determination, as well as the moral vision we share, are the true strength of our city and our democracy. We ask inspiration, God, that our leaders' best abilities and efforts be in service of these truths, envisioning wonderful visions, responding to noble causes, and through empathy, compassion, and justice, lifting up Baltimore's civic soul. As the biblical prophet Jeremiah wrote in a letter to the leaders of his day, seek the welfare of the city to which I have sent you, and pray to the Lord in its behalf, for in its prosperity you shall prosper. May our mayor and city council members understand and respond to the pressing needs of Baltimore's residents, securing success in their public service, confidence in our political process, and most of all, improvement in the lives of those whom they are privileged to represent. Eternal God, bless us this day in our service, for this day is both precious and important. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Rabbi. Right. Um, please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing for the national anthems, which will be performed this afternoon by Tariq Al Sabir of the Peabody Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the
Thank you. The clerk will call the roll of the members. President Young, Kraft, Scott, Kern, Henry, Spector, Middleton, Mosby, Holton, Welch, Reisinger, Cole, Stokes, Branch, and Clark. Mr. President, we have a quorum. Thank you. We are fortunate to have a number of dignitaries who have joined us this afternoon. I would ask the Council Vice President, Ed Reisinger, to recognize them at this time. Thank you, Mr. President. Those in attendance, please stand as I call your name and remain standing. Lieutenant Governor Anthony Brown, Attorney General Douglas Gansler, State's Attorney Greg Bernstein, Prince George County Executive Rusherne Baker, Controller Joan Pratt, Circuit Court Judge, uh, Circuit Court uh, Clerk Frank Conway, Delegate Cheryl Glenn, Delegate Kiefer Mitchell, Delegate Nathaniel Oakes, Delegate Barbara Robinson, Delegate Barb yeah, Delegate Sean Tarrant, Delegate Talmadge Branch, Judge Joyce Barrel Thompson, Judge Marcella Holland, Baltimore City Sheriff John Anderson, Michelle Brown on behalf of Senator McCoskey, Bridget Smith on behalf of Congressman John Sarbanes, Dorothy Bryant, Vice President of Local 44, Bob Sherry, President of FOP, Mike Campbell, President of Baltimore City Fire Officers Union, Rick Hoffman, President of Baltimore uh, City Firefighters. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, um, and I want to welcome all of you to City Hall and thank you for your great leadership um, for the state and your respective counties. Again, thank you. <laughs> At this time, we will have the Reverend Dr. Franklin Lance of the Mount Lebanon Baptist Church to lead us in prayer. We are gathered in these hollow chambers to ask God's blessings over our beloved city of Baltimore. God, we ask now that you bless, you guide, and you protect the leaders of our city. God, we ask that you bless our mayor, Madam Rawlings Blake. You bless the president of our city council, Bernard C. Jack Young. God, we ask that you bless all of our council persons and all who have assumed leadership positions for the safety, the health, the education and bettering of our city. God, as we gather today to hear the state of the city, we ask that where there are challenges, you bring conviction. Where there are problems, you bring peace. Where there are trials, you bring triumph. And where there is confusion, you bring clarity. God, we ask where there is depression, you bring delight and discord, determination. Where there is hurting, God, you bring healing. God, we ask that you bless the children of this city. Provide them with safe places of education and recreation. God bless the residents of this city. Continue to remind us of our great past and help us to believe in our even better future. God, now I ask that you provide our leaders with vision. Give them the wisdom, the drive, and the courage to see and obtain what is best, even if what is best is not what is popular. God, teach us to value all of our citizens. Help us to treat the undocumented immigrant with the same dig dignity as the corporate CEO. Help us to treat the homeless with the same regard as the professional athlete, the student with the same support as a developer, and the servant with the same access to resources as the celebrity. Now, God, teach us to number our days so that as the state of the city is articulated and the vision is cast, we ask that what is planned is pleasing in your sight. God, we have great challenges before us, but we believe that we have an even greater God who undergirds us. Therefore, order our steps, control our tongues, bless our future, and strengthen our hands for the work which is before us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lance, for the invocation. I will now formally appoint and dispatch a group of members to escort the mayor and to the chambers. The members of the escort committees are Councilwoman Helen Holton, Councilman Robert Kern, Councilman Warren Branch, 
Councilman Nick Mosby. Will the Export Committee please greet the mayor and accompany her to the chambers? I ask that the members of the audience to please remain seated and hold your applause until the chief clerk has introduced our mayor. Thank you, thank you. Mr. President, Madam Comptroller, Senators, Delegates, Members of the City Council, Clergy, Colleagues in Public Service, Committed People of Baltimore, thank you for the opportunity to report on the progress our city, of, our, of our city and to renew our commitment to the great cause of growing Baltimore. Mr. President, I thank you for the invitation to speak before the council and for your candor, your conscience, and commitment to Baltimore's future. We share an understanding that the privilege to lead comes from the people and that our success is measured in our service towards them and in, and in the achievement of tangible goals for the greater good. To every member of this city council, nothing works without your hard work, your dedication, and your collaboration. As I look back on what we've accomplished with your wisdom, ingenuity, and support, I applaud your courage to stand strong as a body for the sake of progress. And your personal independence makes Baltimore stronger. Lieutenant Governor Brown, thank you and the O'Malley-Brown administration for your support of our efforts to make Baltimore a better, safer, stronger, and growing city. Attorney General Gansler, State's Attorney Bernstein, uh, Clerk of the Courts Conway, Sheriff Anderson, Judge Baylor Thompson, and Judge Holland, thank you all for joining us today to renew your commitment to supporting our vision of Baltimore becoming the safest big city in America. Today, we affirm that we have the power to create the future that we want for Baltimore's families. We have the power to overcome the difficulties of economic and budget pressures. If we have the courage to use that power, our city's lingering narrative of post-industrial decline will not be the story of our future. Our charge is to grow Baltimore, to rebuild a thriving city where more families choose to live, a place where children find educational opportunity, where neighbors live in safety without abandoned blight, and where businesses make new investments, creating jobs for our people. Together, we believe a new urban story of growth can emerge from our collective choices. The new ideas and solutions that I will propose today, so we may pursue them in partnership, will be realistic and based in fact. The simple arithmetic of declining revenues and increasing expenses, and our own denial of it has been the enemy of progress. Because the old ways of doing city business must end, our future will rely on our ability to evolve. As a community, we must reject the status quo and embrace a call for bold action. Baltimore citizens demand and deserve major change. Our work to get Baltimore growing again must be grounded first in stable city finances. It's the only sustainable path forward. It is a defining fight of our generation of leadership. And we, our local government, our businesses, our communities are empowered to make it happen. We must change to grow. 
Over the past three years, we have achieved more results towards meeting the fundamental challenges that caused Baltimore's decline and impeded our ability to cement a turnaround. By reducing crime, the single most devastating driver of family flight, Baltimore has ended the spiral of endless desperation and moved towards a new hopeful belief in the promise of safer neighborhoods. And instead of tolerating a perverse acceptance of senseless murder as a foregone conclusion out of our control, we now share a demand for a better government response for a stronger community commitment to the protection of all of our citizens' lives. Since 2009, the number of murders and shootings in our city has been driven down to historic lows. Scores of families have been spared the tragedy of the loss of a loved one to gun violence. In 2012, over 300 fewer victims suffered the brutality of violent crime compared to just a year before. And five fewer youth, with their futures before them, have had the few, excuse me, five fewer youth with their futures before them had their lives cut down and were cut short. It is not a straight line trend of progress. We've suffered painful cutbacks. Precious lives were lost that cannot be brought back. Our work to reduce violence would not be possible without the proud men and women of the police department who put their lives in danger. They have worked harder than ever before, and we must give them the resources and the tools they need to strengthen their efforts. A fully staffed police department, even when faced with budget cuts. Smarter deployments with more foot patrols in our neighborhoods, the most effective technology, including a state-of-the-art crime lab and an expanding crime camera network. Already, our network has grown by 100 new cameras since 2010. And we must continue to work hand in hand with state and federal criminal justice partners to increase resources, case quality, and criminal prosecutions. And to divert nonviolent offenders into treatment, especially our young people. Under Commissioner Batts, we continue to focus on getting illegal guns off the streets and targeting violent offenders and gangs. Yes, that small portion of our population that is responsible for the overwhelming majority of violence and terror. Under his leadership, we are establishing a renewed partnership with the police and neighborhoods that is built upon the idea of simple trust. By demanding professional courtesy and respect for all Baltimore City residents from every officer. And by making clear that the badge is a symbol of honor that must be worn only by those of sterling character. While well, we have demonstrated that we have the local power to reduce crime and violence, the, imp the importation of dead deadly guns into America's cities, and the ability of criminals and the disturbed to get their hands on them is rooted in a larger problem. How can we live in a country where gun violence is allowed to rage in our most dynamic urban centers? and shatter the sense of security in suburban schools and communities. I will continue to work with state and federal elected leaders to answer this question and develop policies to reduce gun violence. Thank you. We need to muster the political courage to take bold action. The problem and the causes of gun violence can no longer be ignored or obfuscated by the gun lobby. We must stand for the safety of our citizens and for our children. <laughs> Working closely with County Executive Rashern Baker, Baltimore and Prince George's County are standing together fighting for the same causes. From National Harbor to the Inner Harbor, we've stood together on jobs, on equality, and education, and today, we stand together to reduce gun violence. Please join me in welcoming a special leader in the movement to make Maryland safer, Prince George's County Executive Rashern Baker. Together, our jurisdictions represent nearly a million and a half Marylanders, and our voices will be heard. I am confident Maryland citizens will join together in support of sweeping reforms in state and federal gun laws. Governor O'Malley and President Obama have both proposed bold legislation worthy 
of our full support. If we stand with one voice, we can ban assault weapons and high capacity guns, increase criminal penalties for straw purchases, strengthen record keeping by gun dealers and tighten license requirements for gun purchases. Stronger gun laws will make a difference. Our representative governments can make us safer and we must act now to help save lives. Thank you. In 2012, Baltimore experienced the lowest number of fire deaths on record. The number of tragedies has declined each year since 2009. The reduction comes as the men and women of the fire department have increased their efforts to distribute free smoke alarms to city residents. Please join me in thanking our fire officers and firefighters. Since 2010, Fire Chief Jim Clack, this administration, and the City Council have worked together to prevent firefighter layoffs. And we have reduced the nightly closures of fire companies while improving response times. Today, when it comes to fire safety, Baltimore is undeniably safer than just three years ago. Chief, Chief Clack, thank you for your leadership. Together, we will not be satisfied until we achieve our goal of zero fire deaths. Baltimore is a city of neighborhoods, and they are the foundation for our future prosperity. The biggest challenge confronting our neighborhoods is the scourge of 50 years of disinvestment and thousands of vacant homes that have been left behind. They are a cancer to our communities, and Vacants to Value is showing real progress towards addressing them. Since launching the initiative, 250 vacants have been torn down, nearly 1,000 more being rehabbed, and sales of vacant city-owned properties have increased five-fold. More than 30 acres of vacant land have been, vacant city lots have been turned over to create community green spaces. We're getting tough on speculators and irresponsible absentee owners and have issued nearly 1,000 citations. The streamlined code enforcement effort forces them to either fix up their properties or sell them to someone who will. And it has spurred $47 million in private investment in our neighborhoods. We're also supporting a pipeline of new home buyers by providing incentives to help with down payments and with closing costs. More than 140 new homeowners have received $10,000 home ownership grants through Vacants to Value. And I want to put a human face on this progress and make it a part of our annual tradition of the state of the city. Ms. Destiny Jr. is a strong young woman with a bright future. She works full time to serve the elderly at an adult daycare center. Destiny moved here, thank you very much, from Baltimore County to McKeldery Park. With the help of Vacants to Value initiatives, qualifying for $15,000 in closing cost assistance, please join me in thanking our Housing Commissioner, Paul Graziano, and welcoming a proud new Baltimore homeowner to our community. It's always a plus when it's a Baltimore County resident. <laughs> Thank you, Destiny. A growing city must have a thriving economy. City government has an important role in pro promoting economic development, job creation, and job readiness. Rather than pitting neighborhoods against each other, we believe in one city. Because new downtown investment and new neighborhood investments are not mutually exclusive. Over the past three years, we have shifted the strategy to do more to support the city's major economic sectors, including our port, healthcare, education and research institutions, and our tourism sector. For example, at this time last year, the future of the Port of Baltimore, an economic engine that supports more than 40,000 jobs in the region, faced unnecessary uncertainty. The state began upgrading the port for giant container ships that will come with the expansion of the Panama Canal with deeper dredging and larger cranes. At the city level, we started rebuilding Broning Highway to support additional freight traffic. 
but a related regional project that would allow double stack trains to bypass the Howard Street Tunnel, the CXX, CSX intermodal facility was in serious jeopardy. The suburban jurisdiction selected for study balked, stalling construction of this vital transportation link. The Washington Post even warned on its front page that without the facility, Baltimore could suffer a devastating blow to one of its few vibrant engines that keeps economy afloat. I wasn't about to let that happen. So I told CSX, bring the $90 million project here to Baltimore City, the birthplace of American railroads, and they agreed. Last month, Governor O'Malley prioritized $30 million to support construction, which is scheduled to finish in May 2015, in time for the opening of the Panama Canal expansion. All of these actions will help bring jobs while securing the economic future of the port for generations. We are spearheading a new anchor institution initiative by partnering closely with Baltimore's campuses of higher education and medicine to reinvest in surrounding neighborhoods. The future of the city and the future of these proud institutions are inextricably linked. Joining together from west side to midtown, Homewood to Hillen, we are breaking down old barriers between great halls of ivy and the greater community. For new PhDs, resident interns, and student researchers, it's an opportunity to thrive in a creative urban setting. And no doubt, more young minds will choose to build a life in Baltimore. This administration will continue to strengthen small businesses, job training, and job opportunities for city residents. This past year alone, we created the city's first microloan program to provide finan financing to small businesses, including retailing, retail, service providers, and contractors. We created the Mayor's Advisory Council on Minority and Women-Owned Businesses to develop bold new strategies to help strengthen minority business. We created Accelerate Baltimore to support startups that are developing pioneering technology. We executed a local job agreement with Caesars Entertainment to give city residents priority for the newly created, newly approved casino. That's one clap. That's so good. <laughs> I, I thought that must have been Glenn up there. So we opened four new community job hubs to help city residents obtain skills for the 21st century jobs to find gainful employment. We appointed Brenda McKenzie to lead BDC into the future with a renewed focus on neighborhood businesses and job creation. And finally, 2012 was also a great year for supporting our tourism and hospitality economy. The city was host to several fantastic civic events, drawing hundreds of thousands of people and millions in economic impact. Celebration, the Grand Prix, Artscape, the African American Festival, we enjoyed postseason games of Orioles Magic, and our Ravens won the Super Bowl. That's a big one. These events showcased our city on the national stage and filled our neighborhoods with pride and celebration. So today, I ask you to support our once in a generation effort to re rewrite and reform the city's outdated zoning code. The current code and process create a maze of inflexible rules and unpredictable outcomes that can stifle investment. This needs to change. We have the opportunity with Transform Baltimore to make the process more transparent and predictable, promoting growth while preserving our neighborhood's character. Changing the code will enable us to create transit-oriented transit-oriented development, including those along the proposed red line. And it will make it easier to adapt old warehouses into artist studios, turn vacant lots into urban farms, and promote bioscience manufacturing. I understand that the details of this change can be challenging, but we should stay focused on the ultimate goal of approving a modern zoning code for Baltimore's future, because we must change to grow. Public education is a cornerstone of a growing city. Families have a fundamental right to access a good education in quality school buildings. 
and providing more opportunities for families to send their children to good public schools will help Baltimore grow again. We also know that public education helps break down economic and racial barriers and the ugly cycle of poverty. And the poverty of a government on its own is no excuse for failing schools, mismanagement, or bloated bureaucracy. It was these principles that my father fought for in the 1990s. With new state resources came new accountability to improve our student outcomes. The landmark 1997 city-state partnership has made a difference in student achievement. Thank you. Under the leadership of Dr. Andreas Alonzo, student test scores have improved dramatically. North Avenue has shrunk and it's better managed. School enrollment has increased steadily year after year, and the number of dropouts have been cut in half. Dozens of new... <laughs> Dozens of new charter and transformational schools have come online, and public school choice is available for most middle and high school students. Thank you, Dr. Alonzo, for your unwavering commitment to Baltimore's young people. But the fight for better schools is far from over. While teachers and students are making progress, our buildings and our classrooms are inadequate and ill-equipped for the 21st century. In too many cases, conditions are downright deplorable and simply unjust. The state school system as a whole has achieved a half decade of national praise and recognition, but you'd be hard pressed to say the Maryland system of public education is equitable among the state's local jurisdictions. There must be a stronger statewide recognition of the enormous capital needs of our local school, school districts with the oldest buildings. Our state constitution is clear. The General Assembly shall establish throughout the state a thorough, an efficient system of free public schools and shall provide for their maintenance. The framers of our state constitution did not intend for a child's zip code or the wealth of the local tax base to be the determining factors of whether or not they attend a school in good repair. But that's the system we inherited. Baltimore City is one of the poorest jurisdictions in the state and has the highest tax effort. A staggering 84% of our students come from low-income families, and we have the oldest, most dilapidated school buildings. We understand that Baltimore must do more locally, and our strategy is not simply to beg the state for a blank check with no, with no strings attached. My father, Delegate Pete Rawlings, taught me that that approach is just as wrong. We have a responsibility to take our own local action and put forth viable solutions. In 2012, with the support of education advocates and against the demands of powerful special interests, this city council approved a historic increase in, in new, excuse me, new funding for school renovation. Make no mistake, it is the largest local source of school renovation funding ever approved in Baltimore's modern history. No one. No one can point a finger in this chamber and say that Baltimore didn't put more skin in the game. At the same time, our school system partners have put forth a tough 220-page comprehensive plan to right-size and to modernize school buildings. Here's a summary of our local action. This administration and the city council have made tough choices, increasing taxes to provide dedicated funding for school renovation. The local school board has also made tough choices, approving a plan to relocate or close 29 schools and programs. At the same time, the local school system itself has improved student outcomes, reduced bureaucracy, and put forth a thoughtful plan to, to finance a major school reform effort. Now it's time for the General Assembly to join us with a renewed landmark city-state partnership with resources, flexibility, and shared accountability to rebuild our schools. Conditions have reached a crisis point, and a big solution is required. 85,000 of Maryland's children are depending on it. I'm open to any compromise or any alternative that does not compromise a child's right to attend a quality school in good repair. 
but keeping the status quo will only serve to fail our students, and that is unacceptable. We must find a new way to meet our shared objectives of improving public school buildings for every child, no matter where they live in Maryland. At the same time we seek a renewed partnership with state government, Baltimore must implement major fiscal reforms. For over 50 years, Baltimore's story has been dominated by a narrative of post-industrial decline. From 1950 to 2000, the city lost a third of its population. Jobs disappeared, crime rates rose, schools deteriorated, and many neighborhoods destabilized. City government itself, itself was left with a legacy of high taxes, growing liabilities, and crumbling infrastructure. But over the last several years, a new urban story is beginning to emerge. Population loss is slowing to a near halt, and many neighborhoods are experiencing a new growth. Baltimore is safer. Public education is improving with growing enrollment. More vacants are being rehabbed, and our businesses and institutions have made new investment. Since 2010, this administration and the city council have worked together to close $300 million in budget deficits. We averted an immediate pension crisis, eliminated duplicative programs, and began to cut the property tax burden, all while keeping our core services funding funded, including public safety and public education. As a result of these tough actions, Baltimore held its own and maintained its bond rating during the worst recession since the Great Depression, and the quality of life for city residents has generally improved. Today, we've outlined the progress made over the past three years, but much, much more work remains to be done to get Baltimore growing again. The question for this generation of city, of city leadership is this. Will Baltimore cement a true turnaround toward future of growth, or will we allow our hard-bought victories to become just a momentary pause, a footnote in the continuing story of decline no. More than a year ago, I said we needed a comprehensive approach to deal with the city's structural problems, and I called for the creation of the city's first 10-year financial plan. Many cities only engage in long-term financial planning as a reaction to receivership, state takeovers, or bond rating uh, downgrades. In Baltimore, it's a proactive effort so that we never reach that point and so we can choose our destiny rather than have it forced upon us. With such a plan in place, Baltimore can end the cycle of deficits and uh, the cycle of deficits that have eroded services and, co and constantly put the city on the defense instead of investing in our renewal. The effort has revealed for the first time the true scope of our fiscal challenges. Since taking office, I've pledged to talk straight and to never sugarcoat our problems. Truth is the first step to any real solution. With that, let me be candid about what we confront. First, our city faces serious structural deficits between slow-growing slow revenues and faster-growing expenses. Without corrective action, this cumulative shortfall totals nearly $750 million over nine years. To put that number into perspective, it's more than what we spend on police, fire, health, and recreation and parks annually. The deficit is largely driven by growing health care and pension costs. Even with the reforms we've made, these combined costs are projected to grow by another 40%, and there is a major imbalance in how we compensate our employees. The cost of outdated benefits have crippled our ability to pay our workers what they truly deserve in their paychecks. Second, our city faces a $1 billion infrastructure deficit over the next decade. Roads, bridges, city buildings, including rec centers and police and fire stations need significant investment just to meet reasonable standards. Third, our city has an unfunded retirement, retiree liabilities of more than $3 billion. 
and we must make meaningful actions now in order to afford future benefits. At the same time, our property tax rate is impeding the city's ability to compete for growth. We all know that Baltimore cannot simply hike property taxes to improve our financial situation. To do so would almost certainly guarantee further population and job losses. Every elected official, community, institution, and business with a stake in Baltimore's future should share a deep concern for these facts. It is reality. To put our head in the sand and to ignore the problem would be an unforgivable disservice to the people we represent and the city we all love. We cannot build a foundation of a growing city on the mud of a fiscal swamp. The status quo is unacceptable and the price of inaction is clear. We must change to grow. Since last year's elections and after a year of careful study with national experts, we are prepared to propose a bold set of major reforms to eliminate the structural deficit and protect basic services from devastating cuts, to make modern investments in civic infrastructure while reducing neighborhood blight, to reduce to further cut the property tax burden on homeowners. Each of these things will help to retain and attract residents and jobs. The 10-year financial plan requires tough trade-offs and major changes in past practices, but it also makes investments that reward the future. Let me outline some of the proposals we should pursue together. First, we must rebalance the way we compensate our hardworking employees by reforming outdated, unsustainable benefits and instead invest in better wages up front. Baltimore's pension system for civilian workers is the only large system in Maryland that doesn't require an employee contribution. That must change. At the same time, we can use the savings to increase salaries. We will bring the elected official retirement plan in line with the civilian retirement plan. We must shift to a 401k style retirement plan for new civilian hires. The private sector has adjusted to this model. It's time for Baltimore to change. We've implemented pension reforms for the current public safety personnel. And for the overwhelming majority of the reforms, they've been held up in upheld in federal court. At my direction, the law department will propose curative legislation to address the single provision that was not upheld while we seek appeal. For new public safety hires, we should create a hybrid retirement plan that keeps our benefits competitive but reduces risk and allows us to improve salaries up front. We need to expand wellness programs, including incentives for fitness and smoking cessation to promote a healthier workforce and reduce our costs. And we need an eligibility audit right away to ensure that all health care cover coverage is legitimate. We must make increased payments to pay down future benefit liabilities. Generations of employees will count on these benefits when they retire. We can't let them down. Second, we must make our government smaller and more efficient. We need to invest in technology and automation, streamline workflow, and break down the silos of bureaucracy to improve productivity and save our taxpayers' dollars. We must modernize our vehicle fleet to reduce maintenance costs while improving the equipment used to deliver city services. Baltimore's firefighters, they're the best in America, but the current 42-hour shift schedule is outdated and inefficient. Among the 25 largest U.S. cities, including Baltimore, 19 fire departments have work schedules exceeding ours, with a median work week of 52 hours. We must work with our fire unions to negotiate a new schedule with significantly higher pay to reduce inefficiencies and prevent the constant threat of firehouse closures. Altogether, over the next 10 years, we can reduce the size of our workforce by at least 10% through a combination of attrition and eliminating vacant positions. We can achieve this all without major layoffs and without reducing the quality of city services. Third, we must invest in infrastructure by increasing pay-as-you-go funding in our budgets and increasing our borrowing capacity while protecting our bond rating. 
Fourth, we must create a new solid waste enterprise for trash, recycling, and sanitation by collecting a user fee, as is done in other Maryland counties. We can use all of the savings. We can use all of the savings to cut property taxes dollar for dollar. We will also move forward with a state-mandated stormwater charge to rebuild our crumbling storm drains and fund greening projects in order to improve the water quality of our city streams and our harbor. And finally, I will not allow the structural deficit to be balanced solely on the backs of Baltimore City residents and employees, not on my watch. Tourists, commuters, tax-exempt entities, and private developers will be a part of the long-term solution. We can better align and target economic development tax incentives to maximize their impact and ensure a positive return on city subsidies. Non-resident commuters who use our transportation network and city parking garages will continue to pay to support services such as our Charm City Circulator. The voluntary pilot agreement with some of our tax-exempt entities expires in 2016, and we'll need to renew a discussion with the broader nonprofit community which accounts for more than $4 billion in tax exempt property. If we implement all of these changes, we can reward Baltimore's future. We will correct Baltimore's structural deficit and protect police, fire, sanitation, and recreation from future cuts and service erosion. We can sustain our commitment to school renovations over the long term. We can prevent furloughs and pay freezes, raise employees' take-home pay, and provide affordable, competitive benefits, helping us to attract and retain the best workforce. We can advance a major demolition surge of vacant homes, tearing down more than 4,000 vacant structures. This plan quadruples local dollars for vacants-to-value demolitions to more than $100 million over the next 10 years. And the investment will be front-loaded with $10 million in city funds combined with another $9 million from Maryland General Attorney's uh, mortgage settlement. Thank you very much. We can significantly increase capital funding to rebuild 10 new recreation centers as a part of our new network of larger, high-quality community centers. We can expand local funding for transportation, including repairing roads and bridges while seeking a renewed state partnership and commitment for highway revenue, which has declined dramatically in recent years. Each of these new infrastructure investments total more than $370 million over the next 10 years. They'll not only reward the future, but also provide local stimulus to support job creation. We can create new incentives to convert vacant office buildings and construct new apartments downtown and in key neighborhood corridors. This will bring new life and vibrancy to our city, attracting families and improving our tax base over the long run. And finally, we can use much of the savings from the new solid waste and stormwater enterprise and other initiatives to cut property taxes for homeowners by nearly 50 cents a reduction of more than 22% over the life of the plan. At a critical time when families are making the choice to live in Baltimore or to stay in Baltimore, our property taxes will be more competitive and more families will choose to stay. This plan doesn't solve all of our problems. No realistic plan ever does but it will show with greater confidence that Baltimore, more than any other city in America, is taking responsibility in getting its own house in order. It will send a message to residents that Baltimore will be a better place to live. It will show markets and businesses that Baltimore will be a better place to invest and tell state and federal governments that we're serious and deserving of increased support. In the coming weeks and months, I will present many of the specific details of this financial plan. Believe me, I do this with complete sincerity and humility. 
I only want to change Baltimore for the better. If anything, the financial plan will serve future mayors and city councils before it serves our own political, po our own politics. It is born from a belief that if a public servant seeks to govern for the greater good, even difficult reforms will be accepted as the right choices for the future. The state of the city is in our hands. We have the power to make change. This local government, this generation of leaders has demonstrated the courage to make tough choices and the wisdom to make investments that reward the future. Our people hope and hunger for change and reform. We've come too far and made too much progress to turn back to the old ways of doing business. Baltimore is on the cusp of a proud renewal. Now is the time we must change to grow. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless Baltimore. Thank you. As we reflect on the mayor's word, I ask that Iman Hassan Amin, Amin of the John Hopkins University uh, Ministry come forward to lead us in the benediction. Our Lord, humble before you are the elected representatives of Baltimore City. The people have placed their trust in them. The people rely on them to make the sound decisions and policies that will make Baltimore City not only the best football city in the nation, but also the best city in the nation. Please do not let them, our representatives, lose focus on why they are here. Please dry up the blood on the streets of Baltimore City and place more love and compassion in the hearts of its people. Place in the people's hearts compassion for each other and love for their city. Please make Baltimore City a place where no individual, no family, no neighborhood is left behind. Please allow us to understand that there is no success unless we all do our best. Allow all the people here before you and those not present to work together as a team with a single goal of making Baltimore City America's best. I mean. Amen. Thank you, Iman. Um, please remain standing while the chief clerk escorts the mayor out of the chambers. Chief clerk. <laughs> 